irrigating with the centre pivot or lateral move is quite different to furrow irrigation. With these systems you are applying smaller amounts of water more frequently. This is not a problem where there is adequate irrigation system capacity and system uniformity. However, where system capacity is marginal, there is increased risk of crop losses if you cannot match irrigation with crop demand at peak water use. An irrigation schedule tells us when we need to irrigate and how much water to apply. Not all water in the root zone is available for plant growth. The plant available fuel gauge shown here demonstrates this. Plant available water is held between field capacity and permanent wilting point. Only some of the plant available water is readily available for plant growth. The readily available water or raw. Yield is generally maximised if moisture stress is avoided by maintaining the soil water level above the refill point and keeping readily available water in the root zone. For some crops, maintaining raw for the entire growth period is undesirable as it results in rank growth and decreased yield. It is important to understand the responses of your crop and adjust the irrigation strategy to suit. A significant advantage of centre pivot and lateral move systems is the flexibility to alter both the timing and the amount of water applied. This should be used to give maximum benefit. Any crop or pasture will use about the same amount of water to grow and produce yield, irrespective of the system used to apply the water. The purpose of irrigating is to meet the crop's water requirement, so the aim of irrigation scheduling is the same whatever irrigation system is used. Any water losses that occur through the irrigation system are additional to the crop's water requirement. As centre pivots and lateral moves generally lose less than surface systems, there is the potential for a greater area of irrigated cropping by using the water saved. Determining soil water status is important for scheduling irrigations. This can be done in several ways. Weather-based methods using potential evapotranspiration rates, crop coefficients, rainfall and plant root zone readily available water. There are online tools which can assist to schedule irrigations. For example, Watershed 2 incorporate both soil and weather based information to produce a simulated soil water balance on a daily basis for each of your fields and crops. Plant based methods such as measuring plant sap flow, plant canopy temperature and general crop observation. Soil based methods include tools such as neutron and capacitance probes and gypsum blocks. These should not be placed in low areas where the water can pond or on extreme slopes. If the soil type is consistent, select an area about two thirds of the distance away from the centre, the centre pivots as this is the start of the greatest crop area. For lateral moves, placement at the top, middle and bottom of fields is recommended. Always place away from wheel tracks. Well, I, irrigation scheduling of uh, using a center pivot and lateral move is, is a bit different to what a grower would do with uh, surface irrigation. And, and the main, the main uh, difference is that with, with, a cent, with a surface irrigation, you, you, you have the ability of refilling the whole profile in one shot. Uh, that's not the case with, with sprinkle irrigation. Uh, usually, sprinkle irrigation, uh, the, the center pivot and, pivot and lateral move systems, uh, they don't have, usually don't have a uh, design not to have the capacity to refill the profile uh, in one go. So, uh, that's, that's a big difference. So, it's, uh, the, when, when the grower goes from, center to, from, a surf, from a surface irrigated system to uh, a center pivot and lateral move, they have to really think, change the, the way they think about scheduling. Uh, and the, the main thing on, in scheduling with uh, center pivot lateral move system is that they have to really uh, try not to get behind. Okay, because once you get behind, if you, if you allow crop stress, once you get behind, then the system won't be able to catch up in most instances, unless you have a system with, that has been designed with overcapacity. But mostly, if you get behind, then you're going to be stressing the crop for the rest of the season. So that's one of the things that, that the growers need to really, really pay attention to.
Well, I know roughly the soil, the soil water holding capacity of my soils. Uh, I'd done rain out shelter work here some years ago, uh, and I'm fairly aware of it. So I, you, you can go onto BOM, and there are various sites, even on cotton sites, and see what your evaporative demand is on any given day. I also have a look at the weather and the wind forecasts out. That information readily available on BOM land and water site. Uh, or water in the land, I think it might be called. You can go there and have a look at that. I have a look at is there a rain change coming. If I know the crop's going to come into a stress time and there's a rain change coming the next weekend, um, well, I might only put on a small amount of water, 60, 70 points. But there's the negative side of that. It's another period of leaf wetness. Uh, so you need to be conscious of those things. Um, I don't have any sophisticated uh, device. My own view of the world is that rather than have a, a C probe or something like that, I felt that I couldn't get the benefit out of it for what it was going to cost me. I would rather have a, um, uh, a green seeker type device. I had a look at them probably 10 years ago in America and you put it out in front of the, you know, of the pivot so I was at a fixed height and where you park it uh, you can see whether it's starting to change or not and you know it's only going to be a couple of days uh, that you can run it around. Now there's, you know, what is not in most people's vocabulary today is things like vapour pressure deficit and all those sorts of things and that will come into people's vocabulary in the future I hear it a little bit lately but you know I've been aware of it for at least 10 years that um, it's the crop that should tell you whether it needs water rather than the soil um, okay one follows the other but are you treating the symptoms or the cause um, so while the soil may show it's adequate, you know, adequately supplied with water, uh, the crop itself may be, particularly in the summer of 2009-10 I think it was, uh, where the crop was actually screaming for water yet there was plenty in the soil. So to run the pivot around it does give you some vapour pressure deficit control. This, this total canopy is going to be talked about one awful lot more but I think on the other hand uh, you've got to strike a you know, a balance between, between row spacing for disease control and row spacing to maximise yield. We well, probably only have issues when you have a breakdown, um, but we use capacitance probes, uh, try and put them in the middle. Um, being a lateral walking up and down, you have to be mindful of the fact that one end's going to take a day to get watered. Um, but yeah, we pretty much base it off of the capacitance probes and try and we run a lesser deficit, I think, with the flood irrigated, we try and go to 60, 70 mil deficit. Um, with the lateral, we try not to get it lower than 50. Um, but having the higher capacity machine, we can take it right up if we need to. So it's all a bit of uh, experience mixed in with technology. I think um, that's probably where you have a crop lag, or lag in production is, is through irrigating and when to irrigate. But I think, um, if you irrigate, having a higher capacity in irrigating until the profile's full and then having a few days off is probably what we aim, to, aim for. It's a lot of the machines at North Star are pivot machines which are uh, regulated by the flow of the bore so and a lot of those are set up at probably say six mils a day which is not enough for cotton so scheduling there is very easy you know you're just running it at the max you know we just once our crop starts to get to some sort of use where you know you're just running it every chance you can virtually till the thing bogs as long as the weather's good in front so more of that one is just watching the weather and saying right we've got 10 days of hot weather you can't afford to turn this off uh you know there's a bit of rain or we'll just give it a couple of days but you really got to be be right on it just run as much as you can the guys that have had machines say laterals um or the odd pivot that's set up say around the 12 to 15 mil mark you've got a little bit of play in the sen in in um, particularly early in the season so we tried probes and stuff like that but it's uh and probes probes work it's a good learning tool but it's um they probably don't work as well as in in a flood irrigation where you fill it right up and drain it out because it's um particularly with bubblers because you're you're actually using only your bucket can be so small that the probe might be reading where the actual moisture is so we actually have when i've have used probes and laterals we make sure we put one in the plant line and one in sort of a furrow so you can actually see what's happening in the furrow and the plant line. But in general, I think you, 
you know, you're so you're so close to the wind sometimes with the amount of water you can put on it. A lot of it's just with the experience of what the cotton is needing and your weather forecast in the coming days. It can be done a lot a lot on just the model or the ET model of cotton. And um, you know, we try to have have a bit of buffer early where you can and the other thing you're trying to do with a lateral that you can do better with than with surface is manage your early season and your late season water. So we like to have some sort of bucket in as we're going in, but that springtime from the time you've got a plant stand to to first flower, say you know, mid December, early December is a really good time to pick up rainfall or as to improve water use efficiency. But you don't want to be hitting flowering with a half a profile because if you if you get it wrong then you there's no buffer and at the end of the season when the water use is slowing down you can really use the machine well just to keep the plant ticking along, grab the last couple of bowls and switch it off. Whereas at flood, you, you can't get away from putting that big lick on at the end and and um, every irrigator hates the word of flush at the end because it's, uh, it's the same amount of work. Centre pivot and lateral move systems make better use of in-crop rainfall where deficit irrigation is practised. Deficit irrigation is the practice of applying water to maintain soil moisture within a predefined range between the refill point and field capacity. This keeps the root zone partially full and enables you to maximise the capture of rainfall. This is an effective strategy in managing irrigation with these systems. There is also less risk of waterlogging from rain following irrigation compared with furrow irrigation systems. Successful irrigating with these systems requires good soil moisture monitoring or estimation. This graph shows the crop water use for a typical furrow irrigated crop compared to that of an overhead irrigated crop. The common CPLM strategy maintains the soil moisture content at a higher level than necessary by filling the profile at each irrigation. This may result in increased deep drainage and runoff and lost opportunities to capture rainfall. The improved CPLM irrigation uses a deficit irrigation strategy. Here the soil moisture is kept below field capacity but above the refill point, allowing the opportunity for rainfall capture and minimising runoff and deep drainage risks. Irrigation scheduling using centre pivot and lateral move machines is different and requires a different mindset to many other application systems. Water is not applied to the entire field at the same time. Irrigation across a single field can occur over a period of days. As a consequence, variations in the soil water content across the field will occur. Developing an understanding of the interaction between the volume applied by the machine in a single pass and the differences in soil water deficit within the field is an important aspect of managing irrigation scheduling. This can be difficult to grasp for the first time user. Overshed is a simple visualisation tool that enables you to specify the field, machine, crop and starting soil moisture content. The tool allows you to evaluate different machine irrigation strategies. For each strategy, Overshed simulates the soil water content within the field over time. This will help identify irrigation scheduling and management strategies that match your field and machine. In this Overshed simulation, we are looking at an irrigation management with a lateral move. Here we have an 1100 metre machine irrigating a 1000 metre long field, an area of 110 hectares. With a pump flow rate of 95 litres a second, we have a system capacity of 7.5 millimetres a day. This is below what is required by the crop of 8 millimetres a day. We use a 70 millimetre deficit as the refill point and three irrigation cycles for the simulation. We have three soil moisture probes located at 100 metres, 500 metres and 900 metres down the field. We have set the starting soil water deficit at each of these probes at 50 millimetres. To irrigate this field, we have split it into zones. When we start the irrigation, we begin with a 40 millimetre application depth, changing to a 30 millimetre application depth and then a 20 millimetre application depth in the last quarter of the field. At the end of the run, we come back with a 40 millimetre application. We have a relatively dry area ahead of the machine, which minimises wheel rutting. As we come back, we change to 30 millimetre and then 20 millimetre applications before reaching the end of the field. 
I'll now run the simulation to see what happens. At probe 1, we have kept the soil moisture above the 70mm deficit. However, at probes 2 and 3, we are getting closer and closer to the refill deficit. In fact, at probe 3, we have gone below the refill point before the lateral move has reached it. With the return application of 40mm, we are able to keep the soil deficit above the refill point at probe 3. At probe 2, we have also managed to keep the soil moisture content above the refill point despite reducing our application to 30mm. However, the deficit is close to the refill point by the time we irrigate here. As with the centre pivot, we find that because we have a system capacity below the daily water use of the crop, we are running pretty close to the edge. We can't afford any breakdowns or shutdowns for maintenance. We are again playing catch up the whole time. In this second simulation, we have the same machine as we had in the first simulation, but now we have increased the pump flow rate to 140 litres a second. This gives us an 11 millimetre a day system capacity. Everything else has been kept the same as before. Let's see what happens when we run the simulation. Again, we have successfully irrigated the area around probe 1. We are also able to maintain the soil water status at probe 2 and in fact increase it over the course of the irrigation cycles in this simulation. We still run close to the refill point at probe 3 in the first instance, but as we do the return we see that the soil moisture level has increased significantly. This increased system capacity enables us to successfully irrigate the crop. We now have the ability to shut down for maintenance and have a buffer in case of system breakdown. Overshed is a very useful tool to examine the implications of different irrigation strategies for your system. It can also be used to look at the risks and benefits of different systems capacities if designing a new system. There are systems which have been designed with inadequate operating system capacity. This provides an additional challenge to the successful use of these machines. Strategies used to address the use of low capacity machines include planning on a full soil moisture profile, starting irrigation early and soon after rainfall, irrigate continuously to maintain soil water above the refill point for the field if possible, choice of crop and plant population. It is generally not possible to increase system capacity other than by reducing your irrigated area. For example, irrigating only a half circle with a pivot. A pivot irrigating a full circle with a 6mm a day operating system capacity will have a 12mm a day operating system capacity if only half the circle is planted and irrigated. For laterals, the principle also applies with a halving of the irrigable area resulting in a doubling of the operating system capacity. A potential issue on larger centre pivots is the high average application rate on the area under the outer spans. If this exceeds the soil infiltration rate, excessive runoff will occur. Uh, as you go away from the pivot point, your application rate has to increase. Okay, because then the reason is simple, you are, create, you are covering more area. So you have to apply the water at a higher application rate. So that's at the end, it's at the end of the and the last tower is when, where you will have the higher potential of, of having runoff because of that. The high average application rate can be managed by increasing the wetted footprint of application. This can be done by selecting sprinklers with a longer throw, for example rotators, using truss rod clips to attach droppers to the truss rod, which increases the spread between sprinklers, using spreader bars and doubling the number of droppers and sprinklers each having half the flow rate of the single sprinkler setup. Stubble cover and furrow diking can be used to increase total infiltration by retaining water on the surface for a longer period and reducing runoff. I knew what some of my clients had had big problems at the extremities. 
I knew that I had to keep straw to maintain the infiltration rate. I knew that I had to spread my, uh, my hoses, don't put it out a single hose, so I put it out of two different rows of hoses on the pivot. And thirdly, I used a sprinkler arrangement that had fine droplets rather than big droplets there, it was like the coarse surface sealing. And um, I haven't been disappointed in any way. It is essential that you match the amount of application to your deficit and soil surface conditions. Too high an application can result in water running ahead of the machine, which may result in wheel rutting. The depth of each irrigation event can be varied to allow for changing soil surface conditions during the season. Managing the application mount is important after rainfall when it can be difficult to work out an appropriate strategy to start irrigating. This is because the whole field has been reset to the same moisture content. One strategy is to increase the speed of the machine for the first part of the field to apply a smaller amount quickly, then slow it down to apply a greater amount to the rest of the field which will have dried out more. The problem with this approach is the machine is now located at the wettest end of the field, with the driest part of the field now at the other end. On shorter field lengths and with sufficient system capacity, some irrigators run the machine dry back to the original starting point to start irrigating again. When irrigation has been applied continuously, a different strategy is needed. If the machine moves at the same speed for the whole field, when it reaches the end and changes direction, it will be watering the soil that has just been irrigated, while the other end of the field is drying out and needs the irrigator there quickly. One strategy is to split the application with a greater amount in the first part of the field, then increasing speed of the machine to reduce the amount applied at the end of the first run. On the return irrigation, the process is repeated to apply the same amount of water in the irrigation cycle. This minimises the potential for stress from waterlogging and reduces the exposure to bogging or rutting at one end of the field, while minimising stress from underwatering at the other end. If the risk of bogging is still too great, a Jules nozzle sprinkler package may be needed to allow a lower than usual minimum application. You can use Overshed to examine alternative irrigation strategies for your system, or one you are considering purchasing. Crops under pivots can be planted in straight rows or in circles. When planted in straight rows, as the pivot aligns parallel with the rows, more water is applied in a few rows, leading to excessive runoff. This is particularly a problem on larger systems. Planting in circles minimises this problem. This is not a problem with lateral moves. Crops are planted perpendicular to the lateral move spans and water is never concentrated in a few rows. Infiltration rates and potential runoff can be highly variable even within the same soil type. Infiltration rates will be lower and runoff greater if the soil has poor structure, is bare, compacted, has a hard setting layer or high sedicity levels. Infiltration rates are likely to be higher and runoff less in soils with very good structure and in self-mulching clays. Applied water will redistribute in the soil. The uniformity of this redistribution will vary with soil characteristics and amount of surface cover. Non-uniformity can result from water moving through cracks and leaving some areas dry. It is necessary to understand how evenly water infiltrates across your field. This will affect how you should apply water to your field. Infiltration and runoff issues can be managed through soil surface management using stubble cover and furrow diking. Crop residues left on top of the soil increases surface storage capacity and infiltration rate. Crop residues can also reduce runoff. Tim Richards, a crop consultant in the Border Rivers, discusses the importance of dealing with soil infiltration issues. Yeah, I think infiltration's probably Probably the number one, a lot of that has to do with soil type, but if you do have a soil type that's particularly prone to hard setting on the top, I think that's that's a big one that you really got to tackle straight up. Um, and uh, you got to work hard at getting that right with, with cover crops and lots of stubble in the system and maybe gypsum application, but we always just tried to focus on heavy stubbles. Furrow diking is a technique used to negate runoff. It creates in furrow storage basins that pond water after application and rainfall. This system holds the water on the soil surface until it can infiltrate into the soil. 
Well, uh, usually uh, furodaking is, is used in conjunction with uh, LIPA system, uh, basically. So the, the idea, because the, the problem with LIPA system is that they apply a very high instantaneous uh, application rate. Okay, because the water is not being spread over, over a large area, it's, it's basically concentrated in one point. So the application uh, rate, instantaneous application rate, is much higher than in the infiltration rate of the soil. Uh, so automatically you're going to create a uh, runoff. And to avoid that, uh, two things uh, I usually recommend. The one for a uh, case of center pivot is, is to pl plant the crop in a circle. Okay, that, that's one thing. And the other one is uh, it's full of diking. Uh, and and the, the reason you do that is to, to provide some surface, store, surface storage for, for the water that otherwise would become run off. The, then on lateral systems on darker soil, um, yeah, we, we didn't use diking. We did play with it a little bit when we first developed it because the, the soil was very raw after development. Um, but after we got a system of stubble running, we then went to a, um, we tried a sort of alternate row irrigation with it. So what we were trying to do there was actually water down one furrow um, and have taps turned off on the next one, then swap for a couple of weeks. And so one furrow would be quite wet and the other one would be cracking open, drying out, and then we'd swap over and that allowed us to get the water virtually straight out of the bubbler, straight into the soil. Otherwise, you tend to you tend to um, see the variation in the crop because it'll run off one area and go into a soil type, which is better. So. Centre pivot and lateral move systems provide flexibility and versatility within the cropping system. With the reduced number of operations required and the ability to irrigate quickly after planting, the turnaround time between crops is significantly reduced enabling greater double cropping opportunities. However, the choice of crop and crop sequences will dictate the frequency and timing of these opportunities. Crop residues left on top of the soil increases surface storage capacity and infiltration rate, helping to reduce runoff. You know, like the versatility of them and the, the different crop options has allowed us to probably get through some of the tough times, like wheat price was good there a few years ago and cotton price is pretty ordinary and we only had a little bit of water so we did try and flood irrigate some wheat and that failed dismally so um, we spent way too much water on it and probably didn't achieve much more in yield so I think we probably spent, well, I think we grew uh, under the lateral we grew six and a half tonne to the hectare with 1.7 megs and flood irrigated we irrigated three times and they probably used about a meg and a half each time and only grew seven and a quarter and then we had trouble um, harvesting it because it fell over so the verse like the uh, you can fine-tune management of grain crops underneath a lateral and make it work. The disease cycle of certain pathogens is strongly influenced by the crop production system in particular the cropping sequence. Some pathogens are able to survive between seasons on crop residues and volunteers. The tillage system used and the choice of crop and variety is important in lessening the risk of disease. Infection rates and disease buildup is favoured by moist and humid conditions within the canopy. These may be more prevalent under overhead irrigation. Irrigators need to think about their irrigation timing and be prepared to take remedial action to manage this disease risk. For example, the increased biomass of irrigated winter cereal crops is likely to provide more favourable conditions for the development of a range of leaf diseases. Irrigators can also change the canopy environment by adjusting the irrigation schedules. For example, shifting from night to daytime irrigations to reduce the leaf wetness period, minimising conditions for infection. In some instances, centre pivot and lateral move machines have been known to assist with pest management. For example, overhead irrigation has been found to keep whitefly populations below threshold levels. I do run it off peak and that of itself means that I try to run it as much as possible on weekends or in the night. And from an irrigation perspective they would tell you that uh, you get best irrigation efficiency out of watering by night time. 
However, there's trade-offs there. Uh, whilst those two things are compatible, what to get the best irrigation efficiency and our uh, cheapest electricity are compatible, there is a serious problem is that irrigating the night breeds disease. And this, this period of, you know, of leaf wetness, whether you're growing cereals, soya beans, um, corn or whatever, it is driving disease like nobody could ever, you know, ever really comprehend. And it has taken control of my destiny at the moment and I need to, to take serious actions to control disease. It is going to restrict my production rather than any other single thing. The application of fertilisers through irrigation is referred to as fertigation. A balanced nutrient supply of both macro and micronutrients is required by all crops. Nutrient applications are best timed so they are available before peak crop nutrient demand. A pre-plant application is preferred for phosphorus and potassium and a basal application of nitrogen of say 60 to 70 percent is a recommended option. Relying on applying the total nitrogen requirement through fertigation puts the crop at risk if rainfall prevents field access and nutrients being applied through irrigation. Fertigation is well suited to top up nitrogen supply in broadacre crops, but is generally unsuitable for micronutrient application. The low application rates for micronutrients make it difficult to readily apply them using fertigation. Advantages with overhead fertigation include Nutrients can be supplied at times best suited to crop need. Nutrient losses can be minimised. Nutrients can be applied uniformly over the field, provided distribution uniformity is good enough. Less physical crop damage than occurs with the use of boom sprays or fertiliser spreaders. You should test the fertigation mix for corrosive potential and accumulated deposits. Phosphorus has a high corrosive potential if in contact with galvanised iron. If considering applying two products together, test their compatibility with each other and irrigation water being used. Refer to compatibility charts for both span materials and products. Contact your fertiliser distributor who can advise on corrosion potential and compatibility of their products. It is important that systems are flushed after fertigation to prevent corrosion and mineral build up within the machine. Yes, we, uh, we fertigate uh, and have been for about uh, 10 years. Uh, we've got two different systems uh, to fertigate. One is um, a simple Venturi system uh, where we can spin on the, um, with one circle overnight on our pivots, we can put about six and a half tonne of urea down. Um, very, very cost effective, very simple system. You don't have to buy high quality urea, you just run it through a filter uh, and you put it down on high speed. The other one is uh, because of the um, horticulture, we have the ability to inject through a, um, an injection pump at the centre of every pivot. It's nitrogen and sulphur, you've got to be very careful you don't use any fertiliser that will take the galvanising off the pivot and uh, that's just a very simple bit of research but uh, we're very conscious of not damaging them because they're a big capital outlay. We put some micros through a couple of tanks on the cart um, so we've put zinc and phosphorus through that and um, a bit of potassium as well. Um, we've done that before and we'll do it if, if we need to and in case like we haven't had ground ready or something and we still needed to plant, like we didn't have time for ground prep, yeah, we'd definitely try and put it on after and it's good having that versatility, but I'd still stick to putting down fertiliser before a crop, um, unless you're coming out of a wheat stubble or something whereby you want to leave that alone and maybe fertigate after that. But um, for nitrogen, we, um, we use the supply channel and um, we were running end buggies and we just had a few issues with that where although we've got te telemetry on the machine, it tells us when the machine stops, it didn't tell us when the end buggy broke down. Um, and if the only issues with end buggies were, you know, if you get a clod, you weren't getting the right application rate. And, you know, it's okay in uh, flood irrigation. End buggies are great in flood irrigation. We still use them there. But we usually got someone on night shift and they check them every couple of hours. Um, but it, with the sprinkler pack, with the sprinkler machine, we, you know, we go home at night and hopefully the machine runs all night, but the end buggy doesn't. So 
we went and put tanks in and we're using a liquid N and it's a little bit more expensive but in terms of management I think it pays for itself and making sure we get a proper end rate through a whole irrigation. Variable rate irrigation is an option for centre pivot and lateral move systems. It allows different amounts of water to be applied along any part of the length of the machine at any one time. The variable rate irrigation system provides precision control of all sprinklers on the machine. This is achieved by individually pulsing sprinklers on and off, and also controlling the system speed to modify the application depth along the length of the machine. Fields may be made up of more than one soil type as shown. The most common irrigation practice is to irrigate for the driest part of the field to prevent under irrigation. In following this practice, the heavier soil types with the greatest water holding capacity will be overwatered. With variable rate irrigation, fields can be split into sectors or zones according to soil type. With this technology, the irrigator has either speed control or zone control to optimise irrigation on these sectors. Speed control relies on variation in the machine's speed to control the application rate along the combined span length to suit specific sectors. Zone control enables variation of individual sprinkler rates to match specific zones in the field. The red area shows the keepout zones defined in the controller software. Things that you would put in the keepout area may include tracks, gateways, troughs, waterways, building areas, hay or silage paddocks and any other areas that you do not want any water on. Directly around the edges of the keepout zone is a buffer area. Sprinklers will switch off in this buffer area as they get near the keepout zone. This ensures that no water at all lands in the keepout zone. After installing an overhead irrigation system, many irrigators find they have had to change their management. Several growers outline the management changes they have made. Probably irrigation scheduling is probably number one. Uh, it took us a while to learn that. Uh, probably definitely looking to improve your infiltration. Um, if you've got a couple of different varying soil types and you do get a large rain event, you'll find that um, if you didn't have the right either cropping, uh, cover cropping or stubble or something like that, you find that your harder country runs off and your, and your softer country fills up and then you'll have an uneven crop and an uneven crop's harder to manage when it comes to irrigating and spraying and everything like that. So we're probably growing a few grain crops, we definitely want to stick to no-till and do everything we can there to maintain a stubble cover for when we do grow our next high water use crop. Um, so it's, it's one of those things, but uh, this year I went back to back on last year's cotton under the lateral and we saw that again, we saw the harder country, um, didn't have the right infiltration rates and even though we kept our application rates probably to about 20 mils, it, we still seemed to have trouble and it was probably from the storm events that gave us that problem, not the actual machine. So yeah, I'll probably try furrow diking next year if that was the case. I'll probably get in and furrow dike it um, after we plant or up after the first cultivation and then just spray from then on. I suppose I'm new to irrigation and, and the way I treat um, the way I treat the centre pivot irrigation is um, basically it's a supplementary water. Um, to do full irrigation with this type of system on this size um, these size blocks is very hard. Um, you need to manage your um, your water. Uh, we have a, an annual licence, so we've got to manage the amount of water we use within that one year. Um, we grow mostly grain crops. Um, we grow a lot of seed crops. Uh, this is a sorghum crop, which was um, uh, double cropped after chickpeas last year. Um, so this, this crop here has just been grown on the, the rainfall that we've had plus the irrigation. It was planted a little bit later than we would have liked to because of the wet um, period around Christmas. But all in all it's, it's done quite well. But with our seed crops it gives us the, the confidence to um, grow particularly um, wheat seed and 
we get a lot of new varieties where there's only a very small, a limited um, seed supply available and it gives the um, seed companies the confidence in that we can produce a, a crop of, of, they don't want to lose their limited uh, amount of seed. So in the past we've had some of the new varieties where we've had the only um, reasonable area, 40, 80, 100 hectare, um, that's all the seed they've had, so they've had confidence in giving it to us. So that gives them confidence that we can grow the crop and it gives us confidence that we can do, um, do the right thing by the seed companies. Um, these paddocks here, this one here is fairly flat. The other two fields we have are quite undulating and we, won't, we don't have any problem. We've got contour banks and undulations, but we probably have more trouble on this field because of, it's nearly too flat and the water tends to congregate in the, in the wheel tracks and in the lower part of the paddock where we are here.